Kevin Agati, ESPN Sports Center, and of course uh, a noted uh, Philadelphia fan, a uh, Temple graduate here on the Sports Bash Live on 97.3 ESPN. Kevin, welcome back to the show, pal. How are you? I'm good. Uh, it's good to have my voice at least somewhat back, and uh, it's good to be part of the program once again. Yeah, so PT tells me that you lost your voice because you were cheering so uh, intently for the Eagles in the, what, the Atlanta game? Uh, no, I well, I lost my voice a couple times. I lost my voice in the Atlanta game. It came back, and then it was completely gone about uh, halfway through Patrick Robinson's INT return. <laughs> Uh, on the pick six, and that that's when uh, it was shot. And um, But you know what? It was all for a good cause. It was definitely worth it. Uh, Kevin, you know, the city of Philadelphia uh, has no Super Bowls. Every NFC East team lets us know uh, frequently. Uh, so how cool is it, like, that this they've done it in this manner without Carson Wentz? It almost seems like it has taken off in a whole nother direction that it would have had Wentz been here. Yeah, you know, I, I was talking to somebody about that. Uh, I talk about it nonstop here inside ESPN because we have so many people that, you know, the the one good thing about ESPN is everybody is passionate, everybody appreciates, everybody respects your team because they, they hold the same kind of love for their team. So I was talking to somebody about that earlier today about – not having Carson Wentz, and I said, man, if we had 11, it would be a different story, and and they completely agree, and they were like, but you know, and I actually did this on SportsCenter this morning, that we would be favorites uh, in the first two games of the playoffs, and this would have been a pick em game if Carson was playing. The cool thing, while it, we could say this now before the game, the cool thing about having a guy like Nick Foles there at quarterback at this moment is the underdogs and playing the underdog card which this city identifies, but I think everybody, if they're given their druthers, would have, you know, Carson Wentz back there just because it would it would make us feel a little bit more comfortable, um, maybe a little more self-assured going into a game like this because I think this game comes down to which quarterback is going to make the mistake. And the Eagles did a great job, a great job against Matt Ryan, a great job against Case Keenum, but – when you have number 12 there, maybe the greatest of all time on the other side, he's not going to blink. He's not going to be rattled. No matter what, he is going to make sure his team is fighting all 60 minutes. While it may sound like a cliche, we've seen that in the last two big stage playoff games for Tom Brady, and that was, of course, last weekend and Super Bowl 51. Now, Kevin, I don't know if you remember, but back in 04, this was similar. They lost Owens really late in the year, and it was like, woe is us again. Like, do you remember if the trepidation yeah. was similar, or did I don't really recall if it was the same? Because I feel like the Atlanta game this year, nobody thought they could win. But I don't remember if people felt the same way when Owens went out. No, they didn't. You know, I remember that vividly. I mean, I remember the Cowboys game. I remember when we lost T.O. and he went to the locker room. And here was the difference. Let's not forget – the team had already been to NFC Championship games before T.O. We had Donovan, and Donovan was in his prime. We still had a phenomenal defense with B. Dawk and company back there and Jim Johnson as the D.C. So when you lose a guy like T.O., at that point you're like, okay, well, well, we'll still see what we can do without him. The difference in losing Carson Wentz is you get the taste of a franchise quarterback. And I think that – what we saw in that Raider game, what we saw in the Giant game, you're like, uh-oh, uh-oh, these are going to be tough times in front of us where we feel like we're so close when you look at the entire roster. But the difference is it's a quarterback league, and we saw what Carson can do. We can see how he covers up some mistakes. We can see how he can keep a play alive. The difference, I feel, in that Vikings game is, and what we saw a little bit in that Falcons game is – Doug Peterson is calling a game where he's still aggressive, but he's also catering the offense to the talent under center. And we didn't see that in that Raider game and that Giants game, and that can be tough because it takes time to install. But we're seeing RPOs, and we're seeing a, a quarterback that likes to throw the ball on the run. And that's the difference, I think, when you look at Nick Foles staying in the pocket and Carson Wentz staying in the pocket. 
Nick is a different player when he can throw the ball on the run and he can play the RPOs. He looks more comfortable there than he does staying in the pocket for too long. Yeah, Kevin, we had your ESPN colleague Sal Palantonio on earlier in the program, and he said he doesn't know what his colleagues were thinking, the guys in the Pro Football Writers Association naming Sean McVay the coach of the year because the job that Doug's done, and when you think about it, Kevin Gandhi. That in week two, everybody wanted Peterson's head on a stick for abandoning the run game against Kansas City. And where we are now, one of two teams left playing, and Doug Peterson's this genius with these innovative play calls and RPOs and all these things. It's quite a turnaround. It is. And you know what? That just shows you the maturity and the learning process that Peterson's gone through. Uh, I mean, we're talking about a guy that wasn't the first or second choice here on the short list when they were looking for head coaches to replace Chip Kelly. And I, I remember quite well, you know, how the Eagles were just eviscerated when Howie decided they were going with Doug Peterson. It was like, oh, man. And I, I, I'm with Sal Powell when you look at, at the public perception on the Rams turnaround. McVay's done a phenomenal job, and especially where he's he, he's potentially calling plays – in the ear of Jared Goff when he comes to the line before the you know the uh, the microphone goes out in his helmet, Peterson. I you know when somebody brought that up to me yesterday about Peterson not winning the Coach of the Year award, I was like, you know what, I'm okay with that. I I, I could care less about national awards because anybody that watches this team knows that he is a difference maker with the play calling. He was phenomenal. I mean phenomenal in that Vikings game. We're talking about a number one defense. I know their secondary is a little bit beat up, but Peterson saw something on film, and they executed the game plan so well. And Jim Schwartz needs a ton of credit, too, on responding and reacting after that opening drive because I thought the Eagles were in for a long day on that opening drive with the Vikings. They were fantastic with the play calling, and Jim Schwartz responded quite well. So this coaching staff, and I think Howie and his scouting department and the executives all deserve amazing praise because it, for this turnaround and where this team was two years ago and what they had to take over and how they did it, so much credit. Kevin Nagani with us. So much credit goes managed. to Howie Rose. Hey, Kevin, you back with us? Can you hear me, guys? There yep, we got you now. Hello? Yep, we got you. All right. Good deal. So I, I just think that so much credit is forgotten nationally when you look at what this, this coaching staff has done, and they deserve it. And, and you know what? It's fine, though. Let everybody continue to overlook Philadelphia. I'm fine with that. As long as we continue to win, that's all that matters. Right, guys? Always. That's true. So, Kevin, one of the things Mike and I have talked about in leading up to the game here about the fans of Philadelphia, you know, they get a – pretty bad rap and of course some of the stuff that they do and I know you've seen some of the videos that should not be condoned at all however what would you say to the non-Eagles fans about that Eagles fan base I bet you hear a lot from the people at ESPN about how those Eagles fans are what do you what do you say to the non-Eagle fans about the Eagle fan base to try and defend them well first off I will tell you the videos I saw I'm embarrassed by it um but that you know Eagles fans, like any fan base, they're part of. Uh... Oh, things were just warming up there, Pete. Yeah, we're heating up into the good stuff. <laughs> we'll try to uh, see if we can't get him and uh, finish that up here on the Sports Bash Live 97.3 ESPN because this has been a big. I didn't think they had tunnels in Connecticut. <laughs> this has been a big story this week leading into it because of the perception of the way the Vikings fans, you know, that one video of the people walking through there is kind of circulated around, yeah. and now there's a lot of talk about how the people in Minnesota are trying to get together. So, uh, all right, let's bring Kevin back in because we lost him essentially right at the beginning there when you were saying uh, that it was it, uh, it was embarrassing. Yeah, I don't know what happened there, guys. Um, so what I was saying was, listen, the, the fan base is part of our family. They represent all of us. You know, whether whether it's it's the best person or the worst person, we all get grouped up together. And whether you have 100 people and the videos around and incidents around, you know, the Philadelphia region, it does not. It does not describe what I saw at Lincoln Financial Field inside the stadium throughout the game i saw phenomenal fans i will i will always say this on national tv 
your stereotype and your perception is 100% off base. It will never be accurate. And if you're going off of that, then you've never been to a game. You've never been around the Philadelphia people that I know. We, we, we are passionate. and We love our teams. I will never apologize for that. I'm embarrassed by some of the behavior, but I also think that um, alcohol plays a role and there's no excuse for it. But I think in every single fan base, you can see something like that. It's just we get mixed up in the stereotype of years past and everybody just says, oh, well, look. Well, I think it happens everywhere. Whether it's right or wrong, it's disgusting. But it doesn't. It does not talk about the 95 to 98% of this fan base that that knows how to have a good time. And I saw a lot of that at Lincoln Financial Field on Sunday night. We knew how to have a good time, and we partied on, and we made sure – that we were civil in our responses. Well, I would love to see what happens uh, Sunday night. If uh, right around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, I would like to see uh, how everything acts. And if it's a pandemonium, so be it. I guess they deserve it. Kevin Nagandi, uh, ESPN Sports Center, uh, a Philly fan, a Temple guy, and was kind enough to uh, give us a couple of minutes here on the Sports Bash uh, as uh, the Eagles are going to the Super Bowl 52 in Minnesota. Kevin, appreciate it, pal. Guys, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Fly Eagles Fly.